So Karen, let's start really from the beginning. How would you define lipedema? What is it and how is it different from obesity? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. <laughs> um, but there are some differences in lipedema um, compared to obesity. Both have lymphatic dysfunction, but in obesity, we know that fat accumulates due to overeating and a decrease in exercise. Whereas with lipedema, we know that a type of fat, which we'll call lipedema fat, accumulates primarily in the area under the umbilicus or the belly button and down the leg. And in over 80 to 90% of people also on the arm, it occurs primarily in women and it has a different feel to it than fat that's associated with obesity. It is a very nodular type of fat, which if you look in the cellulite literature, the nodularity happens a little bit later on and in lipedema, it happens early on. So I would say that there are uh, microscopic differences between obesity and lipedema, but really nobody has done a comparison study on a large scale basis to help us better understand that difference. Um, I can tell you, uh, reading through the literature, that there is some thought out there that there is a population of fat cells that is different than other fat cells. And we know that there are many stem cells in fat tissue which differentiate into fat. And perhaps there's a different line of stem cells that responds to hormones such as estrogen and responds to the environment. And it grows. And when it grows, it actually alters the microcirculation around the fat cell, causing fluid to back up and causing damage to arteries and lymphatics. And the same thing can happen in obesity. A lot of fat can accumulate and do the same thing. But in lipedema fat, the fat population is different. So I will say the fat between lipedema and obesity is just is, is different. So you mentioned the lymphatics. What's the distinction between lipedema and lymphedema? I know oftentimes they can be you can they can be lipolymphedema, but there's a distinction between lipedema and lymphedema. Correct. So in lipedema, the lymphatics are intact, at least early on. Later on, they can form aneurysms and break open, and the fluid can leak out into the tissue in large amounts. And when that happens, it overwhelms the ability of the intact lymphatics to pick it up and to move it back into the vasculature. So the fluid actually trickles down onto the foot. It, whereas in lipedema, the foot is completely normal. And when we pinch the skin on the foot, there's no edema in there. And that's called stemmer sign. So when you pinch it and it's normal, stemmer sign is negative. So the difference between lipedema and lymphedema is that in lymphedema, the lymphatics are not intact and they're leaking. Great. Um, so what are the different stages? I know there are different stages of lipedema. Can you share that with us? Sure. In my mind, there are three stages prior to the development of lipolymphedema. So stage one is when the skin is very smooth. And however, there are changes under the surface of the skin that we really can't see. And that includes the formation of those micronodules in the fat that feel like beans in a bag. And then stage two is when the fibers that form around fat lobules become very scarred down and they tighten up and they pull the skin inward and so you get a mattress like appearance to the skin and that means that a lot more fibrous changey changes have are, are ongoing in the subcutaneous tissue so that's stage two and then stage three is when you actually get lobes of fat where the fat actually folds onto the fat below it and you're at risk for it, infections yeast infections um, cellulitis, and also heavy fluid accumulation in the lobes that will cause those lobes to get heavier and heavier and pull the skin um, further and further down so that it, it enlarges over time. And it, it's really those lobes um, that are very, I would say, dangerous to a woman who has lymphedema and really puts her at risk for developing lymphedema. 
And you uh, mentioned in one of your articles that there are also types of lipedema. What are the different types of lipedema? So there are different types of lipedema. Uh, lipedema really, in my mind, can occur anywhere on the body. But classically, it occurs from the umbilicus down on the legs or on the arms. And we give these uh, names different types. Um, it's one type if it's from the umbilicus to the hips. It's another type if it's all the way down to the knees. It's another type if it's all the way down to the feet. And another type if it includes the arms. And then um, we can add another type and call it lipolymphedema. But in my mind, the there is an alteration in the tissue on the body and it can start out in a confined area, but it can spread. And it actually can spread onto the abdomen. It, it can spread into the breast, onto the chest, and even onto the head and the bottom of the feet. And I was just reading some literature this morning that said the best way to assess what's going on in the abdomen is to evaluate the bottom part of the breast tissue. And the changes that you see on, the, on lo the lower abdomen and lipedema are the same ones that are ongoing in the lower part of the breast tissue. And that tells me that lipedema is really widespread. And I, I don't think the type is as important as is the stage and recognition of the, of the lipoedema. So I'm curious that since there's a distinction between the types of fat, why do many of us who have lipedema have a tendency to predispo predisposed, if you will, to gain weight? And how does that work? And I guess the other question about that is about the RAD diet, which is how come those of us with lipedema tend to gain weight and why does the RAD diet work? So I think in lipedema, again, there is this um, fat cell population, this, this different kind of fat cells that probably are present in all women. But for some reason in women who develop lipedema, they're getting signals, which we really don't understand. But in part, it's, it's hormonal for sure. It's, it's estrogen dependent. It could also be progesterone dependent. And when though that fat grows, it disturbs the circulation. So one of my mantras for lipedema is keep it flowing, keep, keep the blood flowing, keep the lymph flowing through the tissue, because once it stops and sits there, it actually is a very potent stimulus for fat to grow. And that's because fat cells respond um, with increased growth rates uh, to all of the nutrients, the protein, the cell wastes that are part of that pre-lymph fluid. And also, uh, um, in my recent reading, I have realized that estrogens are metabolized, as we, as we know, and their metabolites are then processed for excretion by the liver and the kidney. But in a woman who has lipedema with low flow, those estrogen metabolites sit in the tissue and those metabolites are still active and cause fat to grow. So if we don't whisk those metabolites away from the fat cells, they're just a potent stimulus for fat uh, cells to continue to grow. So why the RAD diet? Wait, can I ask? So you're yeah. saying essentially that the fluid, that in some ways the, de the fat cells absorb the fluid because they're filled with nutrients and get even bigger. They uh, do absorb some of the nutrients in this pre-lymph fluid, but they, they're also uh, responding to all of the metabolites like um, as if they're growth factors. So there are stimulants in that pre-lymph fluid that are telling these fat cells to grow. And likely, um, some of those stimulants are these estrogen metabolites. Um, but what about women who are in or postmenopausal who have lower estrogen levels, you still have estrogen. Um, your adrenals make estrogen, your adrenal glands, which sit on your kidneys, um, and your fat takes any testosterone that your body has and aromatizes it into estrogen. So even if you're postmenopausal, you still have estrogen around that can sit in the tissue for a long period of time, either as estrogen or its metabolites and stimulate the growth of the tissue. Is that why, um, so... From my reading, there are three times that um, lipedema tends to really 
exacerbate in puberty, in pregnancy, and in perimenopause or menopause. So mm -hmm. is it the hormonal activity that makes that happen? I think in puberty, that's a definite yes because of the really high estrogen levels. I think in um, pregnancy, um, there are a lot of growth factors which can cause fat to grow, but also after the child is delivered, then there's a catabolism of tissue in the body, and that catabolism overwhelms the lymphatics with waste products because the lymphatics have to pick up all that fat that's coming out of the cells, all the waste products, all the nutrients, all the, the cell membrane pieces, and the immune system is in there cleaning it up. So it's a lot of activity in the lymphatic system. So I think pregnancy and childbirth is kind of a dual um, cause for increasing fat and lipidema. And then menopause, because again, there's this huge change in hormone levels, and the body is starting to change and alter, and it starts to grow more fat. And, you know, it, in women with lipedema, when you grow more fat, that's a, a very risky time. So what causes the pain? Some, uh, not everybody has pain with lipedema, but a significant number of people do that can sometimes lead to immobility. What's the distinction between pain, no pain? It's, that's a very complex question. And the reason for that is um, everybody is different. So you could look at the different layers um, to try and answer that question. For example, uh, there are different people who have different pain thresholds. Um, some people, you know, won't go to the dentist because they're they don't like uh, the pain associated with that. Um, other people love to go to the dentist and get their teeth cleaned and drilled and just you know get in there. So um, I think that's one caught one reason. The second is that um, lipedema is not exactly identical. Um, between people. So two people who could have stage one lipedema, but different things could be going on under the surface to make them completely different. So for example, or maybe not completely different, but, but different enough that we could actually um, call them different. So um, one may just have fat and very, very little fluid because that person's circulatory system is very good. They haven't started to build up that fluid around the fat cells, whereas another person might have a lot of fluid. And again, that fluid is not only full of nutrients, but it's full of cell wastes. And the immune system is very active in that and secreting cytokines and other enzymes which are causing some damage and toxicity to the nerves that are in there. So I would say that somebody who has a lot more fluid in their tissue and that there's it's creating a lot of pressure, like when you get an injection of a shot and when that fluid enters your muscle, it hurts. So an increase in the amount of toxic fluid in the tissue, and I'm using that term very carefully, toxic fluid, knowing there's cell waste in there, that that actually um, is causing pressure damage to nerves as well as causing um, cytotoxic damage to nerves. Um, another component is that some people report having um, knee problems or different joint problems, um, shoulder problems. Um, how is that factored into lipedema? So I think there's two ways to answer that question as well. And again, I think, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to answer these questions with the knowledge that I have, but take it all with a grain of salt since we don't have a lot of uh, clinical studies on lipedema and hopefully with your help that will change. So when you have lipedema, you do have some edema in the fat, right? It's, it's a small amount of fluid. It's not trickling down onto your feet. You don't have lymphedema. It's still moving around. It's just sitting around in the tissue longer than it should. That fluid doesn't just sit around the fat cells. It's going to trickle into any area of uh, low pressure. And so that includes around joints, around tendons, around muscles. So over time, you're going to get a weakening of the joint, a weakening of the tendons, and an irritation and uh, scarring or sclerosis of muscles. So that fluid, again, is inflammatory, full of cell waste, full of cytotoxins. It's going to cause some damage to the joint. Early on, uh, Dr. Kling in Los Angeles did a study of uh, the joints and people who had lipedema around the knees, and he um, showed that early on there's really no changes, even though 
pain was a, a, a large component of complaints. And there was obviously, uh, you know, big amounts of fat tissue around the joint. So early on, no damage, but later on, certainly uh, development of arthritis, and it can also throw the joint off kilter. And there's some fat pads around the joint that actually can grow into the joint and cause the joint to shift and cause further damage. And I've actually seen this in an operation myself, so I believe it. The, um, I guess the third part of the answer to that, um, in, a different, in addition to the fluid, the fat pad, um, is that a lot of women with lipedema have uh, hypermobility syndrome. So they're, they're, when they were kids, they, their fingers were super flexible, their elbows were super flexible, their knees, their hips. Um, they could lean over and put their hands flat on the floor, no problem. Um, this hypermobile syndrome also causes a little bit of laxity in the joints. So you combine that with this inflammatory fluid that weakens the joints, and those people may develop damage to their joints faster than women with lipedema who don't have hypermobility syndrome. And so what would you recommend in terms of pain medications or any kind of um, exercise, supplementation? What can help with the pain? Um, I do uh, recommend uh, pain medication um, if there's a significant amount of pain. I find that um, pain medication is a very... Um, personal um, experience for a person. There's a lot of different kinds of pain medications out there, and I think you have to find the right one for you. Um, what works for somebody else um, may actually make um, somebody else dizzy or are so fatigued they can't get out of bed. So typical pain medications include antidepressants, um, things like gabalin, uh, pregabalin, which are uh, nerve pain medications, um, opioids are used um, commonly, even even methadone in really small doses to help with really severe pain. Um, there are topical cream medications that can be used. I really think that manual lymphatic drainage and compression garments help a lot with the pain. Um, I do not recommend them if there's no flow in the lymphatic system because if you put on compression garments and you haven't established flow, then you're basically just squeezing the fluid in the tissue and causing more damage. So I really think it's best to go to a provider who knows what they're doing to help you with uh, your lymphatic system and with compression rather than just buying them on your own, especially in stage two and three of lipedema. And then supplements, um, that uh, is a moving target right now. Um, I do recommend a number of supplements for lipedema. Why do I do that? Because we don't really have a lot of medications that help with lipedema. And a lot of supplements are better tolerated than medication as well. Um, I was just reading about one today um, that causes severe damage to the immune cells. And it's um, recommended on the internet for treatment of lymphatic dysfunction. So that just goes to show you, you have to be very careful and you should really be working with a provider, a naturopath, a homeopath, a, an integrative medicine doctor, a traditional doctor, a, you know, anybody that's got um, some good knowledge and has your safety in mind. So I recommend bioflavonoids for treatment of lipedema. And the reason for that is bioflavonoids, also known as polyphenols, are classically anti-inflammatory. And we know that there's some inflammatory fluid in lipedema. Also, things like horse chestnut seed extract, which has been used for years for healthy veins and which has hundreds of publications on it, um, I think is also good for lipedema because uh, venous congestion and dilation has been established as a component of lipedema and horse chestnut seed extract helps with that. Um, I try and find topical uh, treatments um, as much as I can because I know taking a whole bunch of pills isn't fun every day. And it's been shown that horse chestnut seed extract gel works just as well as the capsules. I also recommend fish oil because it's anti-inflammatory. I realize fish oil is very expensive. And you want to take 2.5 grams a day of EPA plus DHA. And you want a really good fish oil that is pure and doesn't have mercury or other uh, toxic chemicals in it. So the price goes up um, the more pure your fish oil is. It also goes um it becomes um, fishy. It, it, it degrades over time. And so 
you need to be able to store it in your freezer rather than outside or in your refrigerator. And then I would say the other supplement that I tend to recommend quite a bit is Butcher's Broom, which is a plant extract from a plant called Ruscus oculiatus. And it has good data showing that it can bind to alpha receptors on the lymphatics and stimulate pumping. And what we know from uh, studies on the lymphatics and lipedema is that the lymphatics tend to grow large, become dilated. And when they're dilated, they don't pump as well. And so getting the lymphatic system pumping again with butcher's broom um, and manual lymph drainage and skin brushing and compression and vibration is very helpful. Great. Thank you.